Hey everyone, I'm really excited to be here. Brendan gave a really great introduction to what Kubernetes is and like how the future is going to be with containers. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about what containers actually are. Like there's this gap that I see in the community where people are used to virtual machines and they're like used to their applications. And then now they hear about Kubernetes and they hear about all the awesome things and they're like, wait, what is a container? Like what the hell is a pod? What do I do with it? Like what is all these things? Like I, I, people don't really get that right away. So the point of this talk is going to be about trying to like sort of demystify what exactly is a container and like what is a pod and like how are you going to move from your current world into this new Kubernetes world. So a, a little bit about myself. I've been working with Linux containers for the past five years. I've seen sort of the, the Linux world transition from what containers used to mean in the past to where it is today. And it's been an awesome journey, and the journey is ongoing. Um, so if there's anything that I want you to take away from this talk today, it's going to be that Kubernetes is built using standard Linux features as it is today. Kubernetes is getting into the Windows land, but it's a process that's happening. For now, what Kubernetes is, is a Linux-based orchestration system. And so understanding Linux is going to help you understand Kubernetes. So that's a key thing. And I, I really think that everyone who's using Kubernetes out there, unless they're using a managed service, they should probably have some understanding of what Linux is and how Kubernetes is consuming Linux. Um, and the third thing is cluster management with Linux or an, and Kubernetes is actually a journey. We're not there at the final destination. We're actually like making rapid progress. Really, in the last three years, it's been like amazing progress, but we're not there yet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what are some of the shortcomings that we have today and, and, and what we can, can we do to improve that in the future. So before we get into the technical aspects, I also want to say one more thing. Often what I see is that people assume that free open source software means you also get 24 by 7 support. You go to GitHub, you download a software, you take some release, you run it, and then you hit some issue, and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go to GitHub. I'm going to, I'm going to file an issue. And the next day it's going to be fixed. That's not true. That's not how it is. Like, I mean, there's economics. Even though like, democracy is awesome with open source software, there's economics. And so if you want like, support, you probably have to use a managed service. Or the other option for you is to like, actually understand the technology. Spend time understanding it. Spend time understanding the dependencies for the technology. And that's how we can actually make better use of, of any free open source software, including Kubernetes. Um, so a very brief high level overview. Brennan already talked about this a lot, but I'm going to be very focused on like, the pods and the container aspect. So the whole idea behind Kubernetes is that you are building a container. So you heard the term container. I'm going to talk a little bit about what exactly it means. It's that at the end of the day, you want to learn Linux processes maybe one or more of them, and, and lots of them together. And then you package them in the form of a container image. And then you also have a runtime manifest, because you want these applications to behave the same way, irrespective of which Kubernetes cluster they are running under. So if you're running on a Kubernetes cluster that's on your laptop, or you're like deploying in a cluster that's somewhere in, like, in like Google Cloud, or Azure Cloud, or Amazon, or your own data center, it doesn't really matter. It has to behave the very same way. It has to become, be predictable. And so what you do is like, you combine your container images that represents your application, and then, and then like, add a runtime manifest to it, and then, you, and then you submit that combination to a Kubernetes master or the API server. And then what the API server does then, or the components in the API server does then, is it finds an appropriate worker node for running your application. And then the worker nodes then goes and picks the workloads that they have to run. Then it sets up a consistent runtime environment. So it takes a container images, it brings your applications down to the worker nodes, and then it starts them up, it spins up Linux processes, sets up appropriate sandboxing, container sandboxing, and then it also uh, makes sure that the environment that your application sees is consistent across Linux clusters. So what are containers and pods? You have heard this term probably a lot of times today already, and you might have heard this in the past too. Um, like, What is a container and a pod? Um, I'm going to start with what a container is, actually, before I talk about pods, because pods are essentially an abstraction over containers. Um, what is a Linux container? And I've asked this question to different people, and I've gotten like, completely different answers. Um, containers mean different things to different people. For some of them, it's like just a fancy packaging scheme. For some of them, it's about like, runtime isolation. For some of them, it's about like, um, a container is this Linux technology. It's, it's actually, I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to actually, like, explain what a container is today. At Google, for example, 
uh, five years back or like four years back, containers used to mean just a combination of two Linux technologies. It's like you bring your application, and then you set up like Chiroots, and then you set up, uh, you set up some, some control groups, uh, and that's about it, and that was a container. But today that's not true. Today it's like containers employ a lot of different Linux technologies. They also provide a great packaging solution. Like for example, some of the features that containers provide include um, improving utilization, because you're sharing the same Linux kernel, so you also get like better utilization. And then you, since the startup times are really, really low, so you get like new deployment paradigms. Imagine like scaling up your application from like zero instances to like 1,000 instances as soon as it's Christmas. Like it's Christmas Day, and then you get like a huge sale, and then your service is, is scaling automatically for you with, with like literally no downtime. And that sort, of, that sort of like application deployment primitives are made possible with containers. Um, needless to say, you also get like a simple packaging scheme that like as Brendan was, was, was showing in his talk, you no longer have your dependencies built into the base image that you're running. You no longer have to like deploy rel or you no longer have to like deploy Ubuntu on every single node. You don't have to care about the, the base distro you're running. You only care about your application and its dependencies with the assumption that your applications are built using standard Linux APIs. So in short, containers let you focus on your application and just its dependencies and forget the infrastructure. The infrastructure is someone else's problem. Like the problem doesn't disappear, it's just that it's someone else's problem. And you keep throwing machines at solving the infrastructure problem as much as possible. And that's sort of what Kubernetes does. So let's talk a little bit about some of the common Linux technologies that are used to build containers today. Um, one common uh, technology that you would hear often is an overlay file system. So trying to, like, try, trying to describe here this picture here in that you, you have some base Linux distribution that you want to run your application on. You don't really, like ideally you would not want to care about that, that, that base Linux distribution. Yes, so overlay file system lets you express that. So in this picture here, I have three containers and the first container is actually running a, a, a Java application. And the second container is, and the, and the last two containers are, are, are basically Nginx. Um, and all these three containers are actually based off of a Debian container image in that like it doesn't include a kernel, it just includes all the user space utilities and the libraries that are shipped with Debian by default. So now we can like start layering applications where like you can, you can, have, you can have distributors providing you those basic utilities and packaging solutions and then you can start building your applications on top of that. So you get like a stacked file system in that like you have the Debian image that's being provided by Debian, for example, and then you add like more packages that are Debian packages, and then you can stack all of these together and then put like a writable layer on top of that, and then what you get at the end result is that now you have a unified file system, and to the, end, to the application it seems as though like it's running on, it, it's running on like a regular Linux file system, right? It doesn't really know that there are many different layers underneath, and some of those layers are shared, and that like those layers are, cannot, be, cannot be changed by the container. To it, like it gets a runtime environment that's consistent. And, and the other cool part is that now we can start distributing these layers independently. You can say that my container image, or in the case of container A here, ha has these layer dependencies, like it has the Debian, the Java runtime dependencies, but it doesn't have to care about like downloading all those layers or managing them or distributing them. So that's all taken care of by the container distribution framework And that like, if there are three containers that are sharing the Debian base image here in this case, they do not have to download the base layer three times. It's like you can start sharing uh, common uh, pieces of uh, data uh, across containers. Um, so a lot of technologies or a like, lot of Linux features or technologies exist that try to implement the overlay file system concept. Um, the unfortunate side effect is that um, each Linux dis distro chooses their own default based on the, the use cases that they're trying to optimize for. So you have to like choose the one that's most appropriate for you, or you just like try to choose the one that the distro, or just go with the one that the distro provides you. There are pros and cons for each, um, each overlay uh, technology that you use. So that's again another place where you got to understand what you're building on top of. So now that I talked about overlay images, it's probably a good time to also like touch base upon what a container image is. Like, I mean, we talked about layers, and so you're starting, you're starting to see layers in your container image specification. So example here is like, container images are also called Docker files, the image manifest. 
So here in this example, you're saying that I'm going to start from Debian, which itself could be com comprised of many image layers. Then you're saying that I'm going to install Java runtime on top of it. And then I'm also going to add my application that's on my local host into my container, right? And then I'm going to set that set what my container is going to do when I run it. So it's a container image manifest or Dockerfile is a combination of both your, your, your image, your application data, as well as like the runtime, um, runtime manifest or like how your containers have to behave when they get, when they get installed and when, when they are started. So you, get, you also specify an entry point where you say that, okay, when my container runs, this is what I want it to do. In addition to having the data, you're also specifying how it should behave. So moving on, um, the other technology that containers use is called control groups. Uh, this was a feature that Google originally introduced about 10 years back now, I think. Um, the, the primary purpose back then was to like, restrict the amount of CPU that a group of processes can consume. But since then, control groups have become popular for a lot of other use cases. Control groups now apply like, different Linux features across groups of processes. It's like basically grouping processes, and then you can do whatever you want with that. One cool use case is that now, in a container, you no longer have to have like, sessions of processes. Rather, you just have control groups, and you can track all processes that belong to a container. And if you want to clean up a container, you go and look at its control group, and you go get rid of all the processes in there. So it's like, that's, that's one like, completely different use case that was not originally meant for control groups, but then like, control groups are enabling that feature. Uh, primary use cases for control groups, in addition to killing containers, is, uh, is, is restricting the amount of CPU that, uh, that each container can use. Uh, it's also restricting the amount of memory that each container can use, disk I.O. that each container can use. Um, the other really critical technology that's being used for containers is called Linux namespaces. So the easiest way to think of Linux namespaces is to like, think of having a virtual uh, kernel context for each application. Right? You're, running, you're running multiple applications on the same host, but they want to behave as though they're all on like, different hosts. You don't, want, you don't want them to see each other so you don't want to have like, any coupling between any containers running on the same host. And you also want to like, give them some, some extra primitives. Like For example, you want each container to have its own host name. Um, so you get, like, you get like a virtualized Linux uh, kernel API where you get like, virtualized process trees, you get like, virtualized network interfaces, uh, you get your own like, routing tables that's like, local to your container uh, virtual host, and then you get like, your own dedicated users and groups which might or might not have any relationship to the users and group IDs on the host. Uh, you get your own like, local file system view. Your, your file system is local to you. Your container cannot see someone else's file system. So there's, like, they're all like, in their own isolated jail. And then you also get like, a control group API um, that's also virtualized. Security. So this is something that I often find people not wrapping their head around. Um, like I've been saying all along, containers uh, sorry, in this case, it shows a pod. I'll get to that in the future. Uh, containers of pod, they all like, share the, the same Linux kernel. So um, the side effect of that is that if there is a kernel vulnerability, it's possible for one container to go and compromise other containers. right? Or if one of the containers gets compromised, then if it's root on a host, then like, it's, it's basically able to go and compromise every other application that's running on the host. There's also the aspect of like, what else can you do once you're root, but leaving that aside, if you want to have like, if you want to create a safe environment where like you can have containers and pods like sharing the same Linux kernel, then you got to make sure um, that you restrict the amount of kernel API access that each container gets. You got to make sure that you don't give more privileges than what is absolutely necessary for each container. And there are several Linux security technologies that exist. Um, you got to understand them. Just don't assume that the default that you get uh, out of Kubernetes or like out of any other orchestration system is going to be adequate. Spend time understanding it. And that's actually going to be helpful for you in the future. Um, another term that you would hear with containers is this, is this concept called volumes. Um, volumes is actually a misnomer. If you, go and talk to a, uh, if you go and talk to a storage person in the Linux world, they're going to say like volumes are like block storage. Right? But that's not actually true. Like with containers, volumes could mean anything. It could mean like block storage could mean a file on somewhere either on the local host or it could mean a file that's somewhere on some like remote server. It's like any data 
that's not within your OLA file system. So your OLA file system is isolated, that's very closely tied to your container image, and everything that's outside of that is, go, is called a volume. And some of the, so the reasons why you would want a volume is that uh, you want like sharing or you want some persistence of data. So when, you're up, when your container dies, it's the data that it cares about is still around. Network, I mean, what good, is a, what good is a Linux application that cannot talk about the network today? So like networking is like very critical for all the fundamental building blocks for containers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, networking has had a lot of features over the years, a lot of different ways to build the same thing. And so needless to say, even with containers, there are different ways to achieve networking. Um, the one that I'm describing here is the most common and the most prevalent way for setting up networking. It's that you deploy uh, Linux bridges, and you use like virtual Ethernet interfaces, and you use some IP tables magic. Basically, if you had to give a quick run through of like how things work, is that like you have uh, you have virtual Ethernet interfaces, like you have virtual Ethernet pairs, where like if traffic flows from one end of the pair, it automatically gets transferred to the other end, and 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 vice versa. So what you do is like you place one end of the pair inside the container, and then you place the other end on the host. And then you connect all of them together with the bridge. What happens is that because through the bridge, now all containers can talk to each other within the same host. Now, if you want to go across the host, then you're going to, then you're going to like set up some IP tables and some network address translation where um, the, the packet then goes over uh, to the host network, and then it gets, it gets routed based on your, your underlying network fabric. Um, this changes a little bit with pods, um, but this is how like, container networking works in general. So now that we talked about containers, let's go talk about pods a little bit. Like hopefully it was, it was somewhat clear like what exactly is a container, and then now it might be a good time to actually understand what a pod means. So pods, I mean, people might ask like, what is a pod? Why, why do we even need the concept of a pod? For most scenarios, maybe you don't even care about a pod, and that's okay. But there are some scenarios where you might start caring about pods. For example, uh, you're, like, say you're, you're in a virtual machine world today and you're running your, your MySQL server. Like, this is one, one situation where, like Brendan was describing, you have like a overall like, cluster-wide monitoring service then that's take, that takes care of all applications, but then like, what happens if you have a specialized service that needs its own monitoring? Like, or you're like, adding some more like, special monitoring that's specific to your application, or you're having like, a very special logging agent that's trying to like, aggregate logs and understand and parse logs from your application. And then like, what if you have, say, uh, a front end and you want to like, keep updating its content based on, uh, based on like, some other process or like, you're trying to download content from some other source? Um, so what if you have use cases where you have your primary application and then you have like, some secondary applications that are trying to help run your primary application? Um, those are scenarios where pods come into play. Like, you want all these applications to, behave, to, to, to get dip, be deployed together and, and, and be able to see each other and, and they're like sort of running as one functional unit. So this is very common in the VM world in that like you're running a virtual machine, you can have like one or more of these applications running together, they can see each other, and, and they can see each other's process, they, can, uh, they share the network space and so forth. And so what if you want to move everything that's within your VM into the, into the container world and into the Kubernetes world? And that's where like pods come into play. So you get like co-scheduling, so every container within a pod is scheduled as like one atomic unit. You get composability, you can pick up like off-the-shelf containers, and you can add your own cool logic on top of it, then you can combine them and then call it a microservice. So essentially, like pods let you build real-world microservices. So how is a pod different from a container? A pod um, shares all Linux namespaces. So remember the virtual machine analogy that I was talking about? So all containers in a pod share the same virtual host. So they share most of the Linux namespaces, except ignore namespace. Uh, and they behave as though they are on the same host. They, they share data. So there's a concept of pod level volumes, which could be tied to the pod's life cycle, or it could be tied, uh, it could be outside of the pod's life cycle. And in, 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 in any sense, like, it's, pods have some common data that can be shared across containers. Um, they also share a common network interface. So this changes with Kubernetes a little bit in that, like, uh, every pod within a cluster is expected to talk to each other. So you, you don't longer need like fancy routing in that like every pod is part of the same address space, so they can all like talk to each other. So that changes how uh, networking happens a little bit. But in essence, every container within a pod shares the same network interface, and they have the same IP port range, um, and that's similar to how like 
these applications were behaving in a VM world. Um, there's also, in addition to this, there's also a, a control group jail across all containers. Imagine a scenario where like, you're running some memory back volumes like tempfs, then your container dies, and what happens to all that memory that's tied to that volume? So um, with pods, you get like an, an another level of isolation where two pods on the same node are isolated against each other, and they cannot like, break out of their, their container jail in any means. So now it's actually time for a demo. Um, the point of this demo, before I get into the demo, is that um, in this demo, I'm going to actually show the Linux technologies that I talked about and build a container from scratch. Right? And to add some flavor to that, I'm going to create this container from within a Kubernetes pod. So it's actually like two levels deep. So I'm already running inside a container, and I'm going to create a container from in there. Um, and the cool part about building this demo into a Kubernetes pod is that now I can run this demo on any Kubernetes cluster, and it's going to hopefully behave the same way. Um, and at the end, we also explore how the sandbox differs. So just give me a second here. I'm going to, I'm going to be pulling up my terminal. And here we go. Is everyone able to see this? Probably not. Hopefully now we can see it. OK. So I've scripted my demo in that like, I'm not going to stand there and keep typing every single command. but uh, that lets me speak, because I'm not really good at typing and speaking. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a live demo that's running on a Kubernetes cluster that's on one of the Google data centers. So I'm creating a Kubernetes namespace here. It's basically uh, a con virtual context where like, I can tie all Kubernetes concepts or Kubernetes artifacts into a single namespace context. And then once I delete the namespace, every other artifact within that namespace gets deleted. So it's really useful for a demo. Um, so here is a Kubernetes pod manifest. So remember, in the beginning, I was talking about uh, where like, you take your application in the form of a container image, and then you specify some of its runtime environment attributes, and then you submit it to the Kubernetes master. So this is how uh, that specification looks like in, in, in reality. Um, and then I also created a container image where I like, prepackaged all the Linux utilities that I'm going to be using for my demo, uh, because like, if, I'm, if I'm going to stand here downloading all of it, that's going to take too long. So, this is the container image. I'm not expecting you to follow every line in there, but that's, that's sort of how like, image files look like. Um, so moving forward. So I'm going to create my base pod that's going to serve as my test environment. So the base pod has already been created. Um, and I'm going to see if the base pods are running. And they are running because the images are already there on my test nodes. Um, now I'm going to copy over my demo script from my laptop onto the pod that's running somewhere in some Google Data Center. Um, and once the pod has been, once the demo script has been copied over, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and start the demo script. Um, this demo is based off of an Ubuntu container base image, and I've added a lot of Linux utilities on top of that. So here you can see that within the pod, um, it's, it's, uh, its OS is, is Ubuntu. I mean, in reality, like all containers are sharing the same Linux kernel, so the Linux kernel stays the same. It's just that the distro here seems to be Ubuntu. But if you want to see the distro that's, that this pod itself is running on inside Google, it's actually running in a Google container optimized OS. So your base distro no longer matters for you. Your applications behave the same way. Um, the next step is let's go ahead and like, create the container sandbox. The first step for that is like, creating Linux namespaces. I'm going to be using a, a Linux utility called Unshare, uh, where I'm like, creating a new set of like, network, process, uh, UTS, and uh, IPC, and more namespaces. Um, so if you want to see what my current namespaces are, namespaces are just like identifiers, unfortunately. There's no like, fancy names associated with them. So you just see a bunch of numbers here. And these are the namespaces for my pod right now. Um, let's go ahead and look at the new namespace that I had just created. And if you see here, for some of them, like for the ones, the new namespace that I just created, like network, for example, you have a new identifier, right? So that means that you have a new network context or like a new virtual context within the Linux kernel. And so now we can move processes into this, this new virtual context, and then their, their view is restricted to that virtual context. Next step, I'm going to set up networking. Um, I can go ahead and like, set up networking in like, individual bits, but I chose to use this nifty tool called uh, Container Networking Interface, or CNI. Um, and CNI lets you like, build different sorts of uh, container network uh, primitives. 
So in this case, I'm asking CNI to like set up a Linux bridge and allocate IPs for containers uh, from within the subnet range. So I'm going to go ahead and set up networking for the container um, and uh, networking for the, for the virtual host that I just created. And the pointer to the virtual host is through the proc file system in Linux. So I'm saying that use the network namespace that's associated with that specific process, because that process is the one that's anchoring all the new namespaces that I've created. Um, so my, my, my virtual sandbox has gotten a new IP, which is 10.10.0.2. .10 um, next step is I'm going to see what network interfaces exist. So this is within my pod. In my pod, I have all these different network interfaces. I have my demo uh, Linux bridge, and I have the canonical E0 interface. That's how my pod talks to the rest of its world. And then now I have a VETH interface. If you remember the network architecture, now we have the VETH interface for the container. And then now if you want to see the network interfaces that's there within the new container sandbox, you'll see just one, because you added just one inside it. So that's, that's one other dimension of isolation. The next step is I'm going to create, the, create an overlay file system. I'm going to restrict the file system view for my container sandbox. So I already have a busybox image uh, that I've prepackaged into my, into my uh, test environment. Uh, I chose busybox. It was really small. Um, there are other options that are small, too. So uh, since I have it in the form of tarball, I'm exploding it into a base directory here. Um, next step is I'm going to create the writable layer. If you remember the overlay file system, slide like I was showing there's like a, a writable layer that lets containers think as though it has an old whole file system and like make changes to the underlying file system. So I'm going to create a writable layer for that. And then next step is um, like this, forget this work directory, it's just an implementation detail of the overlay file system that I'm using for this demo. Um, and then I'm also going to be creating a root file system, uh, which is where the unified file system view will be presented to the container. So I'm going to go ahead and create the overlay file system. I'm going to create this within the container context. So this overlay file system is only available within the container. And no one else, no other containers can see this. So here we go. So we have the, we have the overlay file system inside the container. Um, next step is I'm going, to, I'm going to try to create a file within this overlay file system. What we expect is that whatever mutations we make to the overlay file system is only available in the writable layer. And then my base container image stays intact. So that's going to be, that's, that's what this part of the demo is about. And I'm like showing you that the changes that you made, the new file that you created is only available in the writable layer that you added, but it's not going and getting propagated down to your base image. So the next step is to add control groups into the mix. So I'm adding, I'm creating a new control group here called test. I'm using this, uh, this utility called CG create, create this new container. Uh, sorry, new control group. And then I'm going to show my current control group. You see, you see that like control groups have hierarchies. They are like sort of like directories. Um, and like Kubernetes already creates a whole bunch of control groups to achieve a lot of like resource isolation policies. But for the sake of this demo, I assume that like this is where your your pod is currently running under. And then I'm going to move myself into the new control group that I just created. Um, and then at the end of this, my my control group should have changed. Um, to, to be the new control group that I just created. Since they are hierarchical, it's just a sub-control group within the existing control group. Next step, we're almost done. Uh, the final step is like create a proc file system inside my container sandbox, because that's like a really popular Linux API for most applications. Um, so now I've gone ahead and like created a proc file system. But before entering the sandbox, I also want to show how my process view is outside of the container sandbox. Now we can see a whole bunch of processes here. What we expect is that once you get into the container sandbox, your view is like restricted to just the processes within that sandbox. So I'm going to go ahead and enter the sandbox. And then let's look at the processes within the sandbox. So you see here that like, now you get like an isolated process view. And similarly, if you want to go look at what mounts are available, those are also isolated. And if you want to go look at um, what are the files that are available and accessible from this sandbox, it's only the ones that were part of that busy box image. So if you were to like replace that busy box with your own application, like a Java application, then all you're going to see is what your application is supposed to see, and, and that which is part of the container image. Um, and then since we set up networking, um, your container should also be able to talk to the rest of its world. So that's, that's the demo part. And let's get back to 
Let's get back to the rest of the slides. Um, so if you remember I said like cluster management with Linux is a journey, um, and there are lots of future opportunities. The thing is that like Google tried to run, or Google is running containers at scale, at like really massive scale. I think the number is like over two billion containers per week, and this, this data is like really, really old at this point. So it's like every single application inside Google is being run in the form of containers. So that requires changing Linux in ways that might not be appropriate for the rest of Linux users. So Linux itself is, is moving from, um, is, 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 has to transition from its like desktop and like its embedded world into this like high performance servers and like, and like container world where you have like hyper flexibility in terms of policies on, as to like how you want to utilize uh, your, your nodes and, 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 and also like enable more primitives for like virtualizing more and more parts of the Linux kernel such that you can, you can, run, um, you can run more and more applications in containers. Um, some of the aspects that have to improve include like namespacing the Linux APIs, like for example, the proc CPU info and mem info, that's like a very common API, doesn't actually work inside containers. So that's, that's like a pitfall for many users because they're not aware of the fact that like not all APIs are actually namespace. And similarly, there are some more like security and, and resource isolation primitives that have to be improved, but, and, and that's part of the journey essentially. So, so you can become part of the journey now because it's all happening in the open source world. So to summarize, Kubernetes is built using simple and like standard Linux features, um, and understanding Linux is going to help you understand Kubernetes and cluster management built in Linux as a journey. So if you want to go learn more about this, I would recommend like creating a container from scratch, use a tool like RunC rather than like doing the way I did. Um, also like try to identify the minimum privileges required for your, your container. This is a good exercise for you because then you would actually start understanding Linux security and you would know how to run containers at scale in production. Kubernetes is open, as Brennan was talking about. Kubernetes is like literally everywhere. It's like starting to support a lot of like diverse applications. Uh, it's running on diverse um, hardware, like it's running on Raspberry Pis to like high-end servers. Um, it's running on Windows now, and like it's also running on Linux. Uh, it's part of the stock. So be, become a part of the community. Like get to know the people behind the, behind the project. Get to know the get to learn more about the technology before you like start deploying it in production. Um, and thank you. So I'm going to be hanging out here for some more time for the rest of the day. So feel free to find me and ask me any questions.